Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and it's time for another Brewer's Minute. So this week, we are heading to math class, and we're going to talk about hypergeometric distribution and how we can use this in building magic decks and also playing the game of magic. So don't worry, I know these big math words probably sound a bit intimidating, especially if you're not a numbers person, but we're just going over the basics, not going super in-depth and crazy here, and thankfully, there's some really helpful tools online that means we don't need to actually do the calculations ourselves. We can just plug in the numbers, and a hypergeometric calculator will just spit out the answer we're looking for. So today, we have two goals, I guess. First, we're going to go over really quickly the basics of using hypergeometric distribution. There's a few different things you need to know and how these things apply to magic. So number one, what is this hypergeometric distribution and how can we use a hypergeometric calculator to influence and help and aid in our magic deck building and magic play? And then we're going to run through a few quick examples, real world magic examples of how using hypergeometric distribution is helpful in building our magic deck. So a quick reminder before we get to hypergeometric distribution in deck building, if you enjoy Brewers Minute and the other series here on the channel, it would be amazing of you if you could click that subscribe button down in the corner of your screen. It's a great way to support the channel and the site for free. So here we have a hypergeometric calculator. This one's from StatTrek.com. It's the one that I normally use and am most familiar with. As you can see, to run a hypergeometric distribution calculation, we need to plug four numbers into this calculator. And we're not going to get super mathy here. Instead, we're going to talk about what each of these are in regards to magic. So first off, we have population size. And this one's super simple. This is the number of cards in your deck. So if you're playing a 60 card standard deck, you put 60 in there. If you're playing a 40 card limited deck, it would be 40. If you're playing a commander deck, it would be 99 because your commander isn't part of your actual deck. If you're running a calculation like partway through a game of magic, after you've played a few turns, you would deduct the number of cards that you've drawn. Maybe you only have 47 cards left in your deck or something. But let's go real simple. We're playing a 60 card standard deck, so stick 60 in there. Next, we have the number of successes in population. And this might sound confusing, but what this really is in regards to magic is the card or group of cards that we are investigating and interested in. So let's say we want to calculate our odds of drawing a glory bringer in our opening seven, and we have a play set of glory bringer in our deck, four copies, we would put four in there. That's the number of glory bringers in our deck. On the other hand, if we're calculating something to do with our mana base, and we have, let's say, 15 blue sources in our deck, and we're calculating something to do with that, we would put 15, the number of blue sources in our deck. So it's whatever we're investigating, but for simplicity, let's stick with four for now, which is, let's say, the number of glory bringers in our deck. And what we're going to calculate is the odds of us having a glory bringer in our opening hand. So the sample size is real simple. It's the number of cards we're drawing. So if we're running this calculation for our opening hand, that would be seven. Assume we're drawing our seven card opening hand. If you're doing this later in the game and you want to calculate the odds of top decking a specific card, you would put one in there, which would be the number of draws. If you were calculating your odds of drawing something off a of divination, it would be two or opportunity. It would be four. But let's stick with seven, which would be an opening hand. So we got a 60 card deck. We got four glory bringers. We're drawing our seven card opening hand. Last, we have number of successes in the sample, which is how many glory bringers we're interested in. So we just are interested in one. We want to know the odds of drawing one glory bringer in our opening hand. So 60 card deck, four glory bringers. We're drawing a seven card sample, our seven card opening hand, and we want to know our odds of having one glory bringer. So we click calculate and boom, up pops the numbers. So the most interesting numbers here are the cumulative probability. The actual hypergeometric probability is the odds that we have exactly one glory bringer in our hand, which is somewhat useful. 33.62% uh, of the time, our opening seven will have exactly one glory bringer. The cumulative probability, though, accounts for a bigger range of outcomes. So this one down here, 
the odds of having one or more, this accounts for hands where we have two glory bringers, three glory bringers, four glory bringers, and you can see it raises the odds slightly. It goes up to almost 40%, 39.94%. Also, the cumulative probability that we have less than one, which uh, would be zero, that's the only number less than one, is 60%. So in an opening hand, we have a 40% chance, essentially, of having one or more glory bringers in hand and a 60% chance of having zero glory bringers. So that's the basic basics of using a hypergeometric calculator. So now let's look at a few specific examples of how we can use this in deck building. So example number one, we're going to stick with what we already have put in there. Uh, and that's that hypergeometric distribution is an amazing tool for understanding how magic actually works. So let's stick with what we already have set up. 60 card deck, four glory bringers, sample size of seven, successes in population one. But let's say we don't really care about having a glory bringer in our opening hand. Glory bringer is five mana anyway. So we want to know if we're going to have a glory bringer by turn five, which is when we could cast it in our deck. So what we could do is keeping everything else the same. We can increase the sample size to 12, which would be the equivalent of drawing 12 cards from our deck, which would be our seven card opening hand, one for each of our five turns. And then we hit calculate again and we see the odds increase, they actually flip at 12 cards deep in our deck. We're 60% to have at least one glory bringer and only 40% not. So even though the odds are not in favor of us having glory bringer in our opening hand, odds are in favor that by the time we can cast our glory bringer, we're able to have one. Another way this works really well is if we drop this to 11, which would be the equivalent of turn four, we get our opening seven and four draws. Uh, you see 56% down here. Those odds are the odds that your Etherworks Marvel opponent will have the turn four Marvel. So you have 60 card deck, four Etherworks Marvels, your sample size is 11, so your seven card opening hand plus four draws, and one Etherworks Marvel 56% of the time. So even though you might feel like you're getting unlucky when your opponent slams that turn four Etherworks Marvel, you're actually not getting unlucky. Your opponent's deck is built in a way that it's in favor of them having an Etherworks Marvel on turn four. Not heavily in favor, but it is in favor of of your opponent having that card on turn four. So to see a more direct example of how this can influence deck building, let's take a look at discard in modern. You're playing a deck that really wants to have a discard spell on turn one. That is the main plan of your deck. You really need to have that or replace discard spell with birds of paradise. You really need that turn one ramp spell. That's the whole thing that makes your deck work. How many of those cards do you need in your deck to be able to have one of those on turn one? So let's set this up again. Uh, I'm going to reload it so we can put the numbers back in as an example. So population size, we're playing modern, 60 card format, so we got 60 cards in our deck. Number of successes in population, we're going to leave this blank. This is the number of turn one discard spells that we need in our deck. So leave that blank for now. Our sample size is going to be seven. We're interested in our opening hand. So this is going to be our odds of having that turn one discard spell in our opening hand. Successes in sample, we need one. We don't really need two thought seizes. We just want to make sure we have that one. And now what we can do is just start plugging numbers in here. Let's start low. Let's start at one. If we have one thought seize in our deck, we're only 11% to have that discard spell on turn one. Not very good. If we go up to two, our odds increase to 22%. Let's go up to a full playset. What if we run the full playset of thought seize? We're 39% to have it on turn one. That number looks familiar. We talked about it before. Uh, if we go up to five, it jumps to 47%, still not in favor. Six, all right, it's six copies in our deck. The odds are suddenly in favor of us having that turn one thought seize, turn one inquisition. So we need four thought seizes, two inquisitions, or four inquisitions, two thought seizes to switch the odds into our favor of having one. They're not heavily in our favor. 46% of the time, we're still not going to have one, but they are in our favor. If we go up to the full play set and of both and we have eight total copies, then the odds go all the way up to 65%. So two out of every three games, essentially, we're going to have that turn one discard spell. So you can see 
see how using this distribution is a great way to determine the number of something you need in your deck. The same calculation works for turn one mana dorks. If you want to make sure you have a Birds of Paradise or Noble Hierarch on turn one, you got to have at least six for the odds to even be in favor of it, and then it's slightly in favor, and by the time you get up to seven and eight, that's where the odds really swing in favor of it. You can also use this beyond turn one, of course. Let's uh, talk about building a mana base briefly. So let's say you want to leave up Counterspell on turn two, and you're playing a constructed deck. I guess it would be Legacy, because that's the only format, but a double-colored mana card on turn two. So you have 60 cards in your deck, number of successes in the population. So this is going to be the number of blue sources we have in our deck. So like we did with Thoughtseize, we're going to leave that blank for now. Our sample size is going to go up to eight because it's going to be our seven-card opening hand plus our first draw step because we're dealing with turn two. And number of successes in sample, we're going to raise this to two because we actually need two blue sources to be able to cast our counter spell on turn two so let's start plugging in numbers and we're gonna, not going to start at one here because there's no way that's going to work so let's start at let's say eight if we have eight blue sources in our deck how likely are we to have a turn two counter spell mana two blue sources be drawn by then Odds are not very high. You are not going to be leaving up your turn two counter spell very often. 28% of the time, while 71% of the time, you'll have less than two copies in your hand. What if we go up to, let's say, 12 blue sources in our deck? 12 blue sources were exactly 50-50. Half of the time, you're going to have double blue mana on turn two. Half of the time, you're not going to have double blue mana on turn two. What if we go up to, let's say, 50? blue sources, then we're up to like 65%. So having 15 blue sources, odds are pretty much in favor. Two out of every three games, you're going to be able to leave up that counter spell on turn two with your mana. So that's just another example of how these numbers and these calculations can be so beneficial in calculating what you need in your deck. You might think, oh, I'll be fine with eight blue sources, but if you're playing a double colored spell on turn two, you're not going to be fine. You're only going to have the mana one out of every four games. Your deck isn't going to work right. So Use these numbers, use these calculations to help you decide what cards to put in your deck. So let's do a couple fun ones on the way out the door. Another way you can use this is to determine your odds of your deck working. So let, for this, let's go back to Etherworks Marvel. But instead of calculating our odds of having a Marvel on turn four, let's calculate our odds of hitting an Ulamog off of our Marvel when we activate it. So we're going to assume this is happening on turn four. So that's going to mean... Our population size is going to be a bit smaller. We're not drawing our opening hand. We're working with a deck that's already been played to some extent. So we had a seven card opening hand. It's turn four. That means we're down to 49 cards in our deck. So our population size is 49. Number of successes in population is going to be the number of Ulamogs. And we're going to say four. Of course, if you want to calculate, oh, what if we drew an Ulamog or something like that? You could change that number. But let's say we have all four Ulamogs in our deck. Our sample size is going to be the number of cards we draw, so to speak, with Etherworks Marvel, which would be six. You get to look at your top six cards, and you only need one Ulamog. So this setup, 49 cards, four successes, sample size of six, the number of cards we see with a Marvel, one hit in that sample. This is going to show us our odds of hitting an Ulamog, and what are the chances that you get an Ulamog? And uh, basically, in that scenario, 41%. So odds are not in favor of you hitting an Ulamog, but they're also not bad at hitting an Ulamog. The interesting thing, though, is calculating the second Marvel hit. So when you think about how a Marvel activates, let's say we don't win the lotto. We don't get an Ulamog on our first flip. We get some random puzzle knot or something because the odds were not in favor of us hitting an Ulamog on our first flip. So the thing with Marvel is it puts five of the cards on the bottom of your library and then it puts one onto the battlefield. So basically, it gets us six cards deeper into our deck. So our population size on our next Marvel swing is going to be smaller. So it's negative six, plus we draw a card for our turn, so that's negative seven. So on our turn five Marvel swing, we only have 42 cards in our deck. And of course, this is taking into account the cards on the bottom of our deck. Technically, they're still in our deck, but they're not cards that we can hit with Marvel because we know what's on the bottom of our deck. So our population size drops 
drops to 42. We didn't hit at Ulamog the first time. Hopefully we didn't draw one for our turn, so we still have four Ulamogs in our deck. The sample size is the same. You always see six cards with your Aetherworks Marvel. We're still just looking for one Ulamog. Calculate that. On the second flip, the odds raised to almost 50-50, 47% that you will hit an Ulamog on your second Marvel flip. So it's still not in favor, but when you consider you get a 42% chance the first time and then another 47% chance the second time, if you keep flipping a coin over and over again, sooner or later it's going to come out in your favor. And these are pretty close to coin flips. And if we take away another seven cards to simulate a third Marvel flip, which would put us down to 35 unknown cards in our deck, and we calculate that again, then we're up to 54%. So the coin flip is actually in our favor by the third time. So even though the odds of hitting an Ulamog on the first flip are not all that likely, your odds are cumulative and they keep adding up. So you keep having more and more of these 50-50 chances and sooner or later you're going to win that 50-50 chance and by the time you get to the second coin flip, the odds are basically really even in the third coin flip, the odds are in favor of you hitting an Ulamog with your Marvel if you haven't already done so already. So anyway, that is hypergeometric distribution for magic in deck building and that's our brewer's minute for this week so i know it went super long probably not a brewer's minute more like a brewer's 15 minutes or 20 minutes but there's a lot to cover there and i think this tool is super important and super helpful so i wanted to make sure i got it out there i will put a link to the calculator in the description the one that i use but if you just search hypergeometric calculator i'm sure you can find other options as well so i'll put a link in there mess around with it hopefully this tutorial on using the basics of hypergeometric distribution for playing magic and deck building is helpful. I use it quite frequently to calculate things, to know the odds, to know how many of a color I need in my mana base, to know how many copies of an effect I need in my deck, like we talked about with the thought seizes and inquisitions. If I really want that in turn one, how many do I need? If I need double blue mana on turn two, how many blue sources do I need? And this is stuff that is somewhat intuitive if you've been building decks a long time, but it's it's so nice and easy to be able to see the actual numbers because sometimes they're pretty surprising. Anyway, that's been our Brewers Minute for this week. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.